Our lectionary story this week, the story that I want to talk with you about, is a story about a woman um, who anoints Jesus' feet or head with oil or tears or water. It depends on what version you read. In fact, this story of the woman is so popular that Matthew tells it, Mark tells it, Luke tells it, John tells it, but they all kind of make it their own and tell it in a different way. In John's version, which is the very last one to be written, the story is um, set very late in Jesus' ministry, kind of as a precursor to the end times. Um, it is after Lazarus has been miraculously healed, risen from the dead. Um, Mary, it, so it happens in Bethany, and Mary, who is Lazarus' sister, is the one who does the anointing. And she anoints Jesus' feet with oil and tears. The offense in the story is the extravagance, um, considered wasteful extravagance. And um, the purpose of the story, the purpose of her action is to show uh, the divinity, the oneness, the this is the one of Jesus, the significance of Jesus. So that's the purpose. This story is also told by Matthew and Mark, and interestingly, they have exactly the same story. They share the same cue source, and their story is the same. It is similar to John's in that it is late at the end of Jesus' ministry. The offense is the extravagant wastefulness. Um, in this case, the anointing is Jesus' head, not feet, which might be significant. And also significant is that the woman is anonymous. It's not Mary of Bethany. So which, which woman is it? That does this thing. It's not clear. Luke remembers this woman as um, having an alabaster jar and anointing Jesus's feet, not head. She is anonymous, not Mary, and certainly not Mary of Bethany. And interestingly in Luke's version, it happens early in Jesus's ministry. It's a precursor to a set of stories about um, expanding the table and about um, sinners being welcome. She's a sinner in Luke's version. And and it is a precursor to that, you know, let's quit judging and excluding and let's open up the table, open up the experience of sacred living together. Importantly, the story in Luke's telling is followed almost immediately by the story for Luke of Mary Magdalene or the introduction of Mary Magdalene. And she's, um, she's a sinner. So that's the Luke introduction of Mary Magdalene. Now please notice that Mary Magdalene has not come up in any of these other stories. In the Bible, this is not a story about Mary Magdalene. Importantly, how we know this story of the woman who anoints Jesus is quite different from the Bible story. The story that we know of Mary who anoints Jesus' feet is that it's Mary Magdalene. And it's a very intimate loving, sexual, almost encounter that she's wiping Jesus's feet with her hair and her tears and the ointment. It's um, at the end of Jesus's ministry and it's her love song to him. All right, let me pause right here. For me, the story will always be about Yvonne Illiman singing the song, I Don't Know How to Love Him in Jesus Christ Superstar. The song was, I think in 1971 or 72, I would have been about 10 years old. I was enthralled with this song and this woman and this image and I suspect it was my latent um, lesbian crush. I don't know. At any rate, I found it profound, this love song that she sang to Jesus, right? And the way it was offered. Curiously, as this song came out and as I learned this song and as I fell in love with this um, this whole idea, this whole woman, this whole ministry, um, the good church folks where I went to church were upset about this song, upset about this um, rendition, upset about this whole thing, and they were just aghast at the sinfulness of Mary and the mis misread of the Bible, and it was just a terrible thing, a terrible thing. That dissonance between my love for this offering of I don't know how to love him, this Mary Magdalene wiping Jesus' feet, and the good church folks' angst about it was probably um, the important seeding of my distrust of the institution. I trace it back at least that far. But I, what I will say is those good church folk who um, 
did not like Mary touching Jesus in that way, who did not like the idea of a potential love affair between Jesus and Mary, they, uh, those same good church folk, uh, very quickly signed on when James Dobson came around with his patriarchal hate group called Focus on the Family. And these good church folk were devotees of that whole patriarchal ilk. I think the way we tell the story of the woman who anoints Jesus, whether it's an anonymous woman or it's Mary of Bethany or it's Mary Magdalene from tradition, however we tell the story, whether she anoints his head or his feet, whether it's a, an intimate embrace or a, a more kind of perfunctory thing, I think our telling says more about our beliefs than it says about the text. Because in fact, the text, there are variants in the text and they don't agree with each other. And so I think what we bring to the text is really important to be aware of. I think this is one of those times where our telling really reveals our belief system that we bring. Fueling the rumors of sin in this um, telling of the story or in the many tellings of this story are the detail um, in Luke and John that Mary anoints Jesus' feet, that she touches his feet. And that's a really, um, washing one's feet is a really tender experience, a really intimate experience. As I imagine Mary wiping Jesus' feet so tenderly, it kind of I, I see it as a, as a lover might. And the whole idea of feet is kind of loaded. Do you remember the story? where Ruth sneaks into Boaz's tent and she uncovers his feet and all of a sudden they've had a sexual encounter. It's a really loaded. I wouldn't overread that whole feet imagery, but I, but it's definitely there and I don't think we should ignore it. There are definitely sexual overtones, intimate, intimate overtones to this story in all of its tellings. Cutting to the chase, let me ask this question. Do you think that intimacy between Jesus and the woman is sin? Is it your belief that a sexual encounter between a woman, maybe Mary of Bethany, maybe Mary Magdalene, maybe just an anonymous woman, do you think a sexual intimate encounter is a sin? Certainly much of white Christendom, modern tradition, um, I say white Christendom because honestly it comes out of Europe and it's very Eurocentric, much of that tradition would suggest that Jesus is faultless and blameless, and by that they mean sexless. Some years ago, I dove into the stories of Mary, and I, I love these stories of Mary because they are um, innumerable and fascinating, and mostly the stories of Mary Magdalene. And they they pick off and pick up on this story as theirs, and sometimes don't. But but they actually take the story from where from the crucifixion, the resurrection, and then wonder what if after that. The stories of Mary Magdalene um, in tradition, not the biblical tradition, but the non-canonical or the apocryphal tradition are really rich and fascinating. It turns out um, that she actually, with Jesus who is resurrected, they actually escape Jerusalem and they um, slide into the Southern European areas somehow and they have not only one child but then they have another child. It's a really fascinating set of stories and traditions. Um, in the Da Vinci Code, Dan, Dan Brown uh, a decade or so ago popularized some of these stories but they're very ancient. And it's interesting you can see some images of them in art. There's one particular image that uh, was made into a stained glass window in 1906 I believe. It's in a church, church um, of Kilmore in uh, Scotland. So it's a fascinating picture of a very pregnant Mary Magdalene with Jesus right there holding her arm, you know, claiming her and this baby. My question is, how do you feel about that? How do you feel about the fact that Jesus might have been sexual with Mary or with somebody else or a guy? You know, I mean, can we even think about that? That Jesus might have been sexual? Is sex essentially sinful? I don't think so. I think these stories are rich and fanciful and life-giving and empowering and, you know, kind of busting out the seams of our expectations and empowering us to think new thoughts. What if the power of the corrupt state didn't have the last word? What if patriarchy didn't have the last word? What if Mary and Jesus were allowed 
to live out their fullness of their lives together, their sex-filled <laughs> lives together. What if they had children? What if Jesus wasn't a sexually um, neutered object in our memory, but the fullness of a, of a man? If we liberate the story from it being about sex and the sin of sex, we begin to see that what the real sin in the story, and I, I'm really drawing from Luke here, the real sin is the lack of hospitality. The real sin is the way that this woman is labeled as a sinner and set aside. The real sin is when we close the table and don't allow everyone in. The sin isn't that she's sexual or that Jesus is sexual. That's perfectly fine. That's normal. That's human. That's who we were created to be. The sin is when we build walls and we exclude. The sin is when this woman and the women in her company are kept apart. As we, this week, saw a whole new round of images of children and families, asylum-seeking families, crowded, like smashed together in cages and an underpass in El Paso, highway underpass, open air in cages, obviously reminiscent of the Holocaust. As we saw those images happening in real time in our nation today, the sin of inhospitality, inhospi of being inhospitable, is profound. And this reading from Luke's Gospel becomes incredibly relevant. To this end, Luke's portrayal of the woman who upends the stereotypes, who challenges the status quo, who in, in who with Jesus expands the table. This image of the woman, call her whatever name you might want to call her, but this story where she is expanding the welcome is the story that I think we need to share today in our churches, desperately. May whatever version we share honor the spirit of this woman that is shared but not contained in the texts that try. May our passion be as deep as hers and our courage as broad. For these, my friends, are perilous times.